Excellent. I should now be recording. Okay, so in today's lecture, we're going to continue where we had previously left off. So we had last left off where we had uh, looked at the Hello World program in C, and we looked at a bunch of variable declarations, and uh, and then we printed those out. So at this point, we're mapping our Java knowledges into learning how to implement C code. And so we're going to continue to do that in this lecture as well. We're, we'll continue to look at examples that look very much like Java code, and then we'll map it into um, uh, C, the context of C. It's, it'll actually be C code. It'll also just happen to look a lot like Java as well. So we'll still be in this section one right here on the basic types and operators. And I'd love if we can also get through control structures in today's lecture as well, which I think should be accomplishable. We might even be able to get through section three, which is on complex data types. So again, this is just the overview from the PDFs that we're kind of basing these particular lectures off of, which is going to be um, the essential C, which we had, uh, uh, I had given a link to that in the syllabus and also in uh, one of the earlier uh, slides on the lecture notes. Okay, so let's let's walk through this really quick just to see where we last left off. So yeah, we are we talked about the different uh, types. Oh, I think this is about where we got to where we got to our um, floating points. Yeah, we looked at this. Comments are the same as C. Okay, so variables. And finally, we're going to get to after the basic types, which is what we looked at last lecture, we should be getting to the concept of operators. So we'll take a look at the operators. Um, we'll look at truncation. I think I'm going to look at truncation after the operators. We already talked about how there's no actual Boolean value. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to jump back over to the um, the live set of code so we can actually start looking at these. So there are several different um, primitive operators that are built into C. And what we're going to see is that these primitive operators are very similar to the primitive operators that are built into Java. So I'm going to open up this source code file, 0 to uh, dash arithmetic dot C. Actually, let's stretch this out all the way. Okay, let's see here. Let's close this out so that we have the full space that we have here. So we'll see, given our C code, and again, I'm going to go ahead and uh, include our standard input output header file so that we get access to a printf function inside of our main function, which we need to have but since that's the launch point of our application, we'll go ahead and put everything in the scope of our function. So everything will just be locally scoped to main. And so here, I'm just going to declare two variables, a A and a B, and I'll assign those, I'll initialize those to 15 and four, and then we'll just do some basic computation. So we could say our arithmetic operation our additive property addition is exactly what we'd expect uh, in, as it were, was in Java, where we can go ahead and resolve a value. And when we resolve a value in an expression like this, then we could do an assignment statement. I, this might be the first time we did an assignment. I don't remember if we did assignments. I think we did assignments in the last code too, but it's, it's always, but I think it was all literal values. Now that we're looking at operations, the rules, for assignments are the same in C as they are in Java. That means that the last thing to occur with an assignment operation is for the assignment to occur. So we wait for the left hand, uh, the right hand expression to resolve into an actual value. When that becomes a value, we can then uh, store that in memory based off of this alias. And this alias just maps to some memory uh, address. And we'll, we'll learn much, much deeper about how memory addresses are resolved and how these um, these variable names are just identifiers or just labels, uh, human readable labels for us to access some reserve space in memory for this particular value. So we're going to call this sum and the rules are the same. Once we initialize 
a variable within a given scope, we can't reinitialize it. Uh, we can always access it by its name, and then we can always reassign the value with a single equal sign, a uh, assignment operator. So he'll, we'll just add those two values, and then we'll print that up for our sum. We'll go ahead and subtract those two values. We'll initialize a different variable we'll call difference, and we'll print out the difference. We'll go ahead and use the asterisk for multiplication, save that in a different variable called product, and then we'll print out the product. We'll go ahead and uh, do our division, A divided by B. Keep in mind, division works differently between various data types. So for instance, integers don't have fractional numbers. That means it's gonna truncate the value just like in Java. And so because of that, we also have the modulus symbol, which is very useful for integer-based division, which shows us the remainder amount. So pretty much all the very basic arithmetic operators that you learned about in the intro to programming class are exactly the same. And actually, let's go ahead and see if we can't compile this and take a look at the results. So this is uh, 0, 02. So we'll call GCC. That's going to be our, um, our compiler. We're going to compile our code. Uh, here we go into object code. So here we go, uh, zero two dash arithmetic dot C, and we want to give it an output. And we'll just call this math, make it easy. Okay, so now that we have that, let's go ahead and execute that from the application uh, from our shell. So dot slash, and then we'll go ahead and give the application name. We'll run that, execute that, and we'll see that we get all the output we'd expect to get. So our sum, our difference, our product, our quotient, our remainder. Excellent. And so if there's, if for any reason you have questions, just post them into the chat. If not, I'll continue to just kind of walk down through these a uh, source code examples we have so we can see how C kind of maps into our concepts related to Java. And we'll see that for the most part, it's like almost one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay, uh, let me do this. I'll also remove my math. Okay, and you'll see math now has been deleted, so we can remove our files as we go ahead and uh, and test them so that we can keep our workspace clean. Okay, if we're learning about arithmetic operators, let's go ahead and just talk about um, the increment and decrement operators as well. So as you might recall from Java, and just in case this wasn't really like talked about in detail in Java, there's actually two forms of the increment operator. So you could put the, so recall that the increment operator is the plus plus sign or the decrement operator is the minus minus sign. And so that allows you to take a value, a numerical value, and you can either increase it by one unit, unit if it's uh, increment, or you can decrease it by one unit if it's a decrement. Now you could actually put the plus plus in front of your variable name, or you can put the plus plus after your variable name. That's the other thing. The uh, increment and post, uh, the increment and decrement operators can only be used on something that's uh, stored in memory, like a variable. You can't use it on a uh, literal value because it's doing a, uh, it's not just incrementing, but it's uh, overriding the value inside of that variable. So I just want to make sure everyone has a strong understanding of the behaviors as it distinguishes between a pre-increment and a post-increment. So the pre-increment effectively means that, so if it's all on one line, it doesn't matter. So if we had, say for instance, uh, just A, A equals five, and then I did A plus plus, it doesn't matter if I put the plus plus in front or behind it, because that's the only operation that's occurring for that statement. Now you can somehow, you can oftentimes have multiple operations that occur on the same statement. So in, for instance, in these lines, say for instance, line 10, I'm doing both a pre-increment operation in addition to a print statement or a print uh, operation. And both these have to execute on the same line. And so the pre-increment versus po post-increment simply means I can decide what order the increment's going to occur in. So if I put the plus plus in front of the result, and if my result here was a uh, originally five, so if here on line eight, I say, okay, 
Let, let's walk through this really quick. I'm going to assign a variable. A is five, a uh, result that's undefined. At the first instance at eight, I'm going to assign to result the value of A. I'm going to print out the result of uh, that, of result. I'm going to print out result and just say, OK, before I do anything, this is my value of result. Then I'm going to do a pre-increment and print result at the same time. And so a pre-increment should actually do the addition. It should increment and then print out. So then it should actually print out to be six and not five. And then after that statement is executed, well, the increment occurred, so it should be six still. So in a post increment, we're going to reset the value of result back to A, which is five. We're going to print out the value before we do anything, which should be five. In a post increment, we're going to do everything else on this line. So in this instance, it's going to be the print uh, operation. And then we're going to do the post increment. So then it's going to print five and then increment it to six. So after that instruction is executed, and if we print the next statement after on line 17, we'll see that result is in six. And so the rules for decrement is going to be exactly the same, and but except for incrementing a unit, we're going to be decrementing a unit. So if we set result back to A, and then we print the uh, initial value before we do anything, if we do a pre-decrement, it's going to still print out as five. And then after that operation, after that statement's done, or that... Um, yeah, the statement's done executing entirely, it'll then be four. Then we'll reset our result back to, to five. We'll do a print before we try to do the post decrement. We're going to do the post decrement, which means we'll print out the value first. So it'll be five, then decrement to four. And then finally, we'll go ahead and then print the result after we're done line 28, so which should be four. So let's just make sure that that behaves the way we expect it to. Let's go ahead and compile our code. So that's GCC 03-increment.c. I want to call this, let's call it increment. That's perfectly fine. Let's go ahead and compile that. Let's run that increment. And let's see what our output is. And we'll see before our value is 5. During the pre-increment, right, it goes to 6. And then prints. And then after, of course, it's still 6. Um, when we go to do our post increment, we reset back to five. During the statement that has the post increment, it's still five during the print, but then after that has resolved, it's finally going to be six. And then for the decrements, we could say it's going to reset to five. During the pre-decrement, it decrements first and prints out, and then we have the value still at four after that. And then in the post decrement, we start with five, we reset that value. We decrement before we print. I mean, I'm sorry, post decrement, we print before we decrement. And then we finally see that we, after that statement resolves, that the value has been decremented to four. Excellent. Okay, so and just I'm just checking uh, to see if there's any comments. So after doing just a quick overview of uh, decrement and um, and uh, increment in terms of post and pre-decrement, I have a couple of questions here. One is out of curiosity, when you compile and it creates that executable file, is that similar to how the Java compile creates a class file? So that's a very good question. So yes, conceptually what's happening when I go and create, so, when I go and call the Java compiler, Java is a very interesting language. We think of it as a compile type language, uh, much like C is a compile type language. When I call the GCC compiler, I'm taking my human readable code, which is what we see inside this text editor here, this code editor, and then it will compile into it what's called object code. And so the object code is then effectively going to be our our machine code that's executable. So if I give that file type to the shell, the shell can then parse our object code in a way that it then can execute those instructions. So the machine knows how to execute that inside of the system, inside of the uh, inside of the OS. Uh, now, how does that relate towards 
the class files in a Java compiler. So when we have our source code, a .java file, and we invoke the Java compiler, the Java compiler converts, it translates that Java code into what's called bytecode, and bytecode is compiled to run on the JVM, which is short for the Java virtual machine. And so you could think of the JVM as effectively like what your OS, what your system is doing with your C code. Now, one of the things that really distinguished Java and made Java so popular as opposed to C is that all your Java code runs through the JVM. So the JVM is like this abstracted layer where Java code executes at that is distinguishably different and lives on top of your actual operating system. So that makes Java code incredibly portable. So the entity that ensures that your JVM works for every system is Oracle. They're the curators of the language. So, so long as Oracle has a version of the JVM that works on any kind of system, then your Java code can be transported from one machine to another. And this is why, uh, and, and the JV, they have JVMs on, on everything, They're like refrigerators and toasters and calculators and obviously uh, laptops and, um, and uh, well, clearly like... Uh, Google had leaned into uh, using um, Java for Android. So Java is immensely powerful because almost every computational device has a form of JVM on it. And if you author code in Java, it can run through the JVM without you having to be concerned about some of the hardware considerations. And this is where we distinguish with C. Remember, C is designed to be a systems language. C is designed to be an OS level language. It's designed to talk to the hardware and not abstract that away. So as a result, we get much more performant code in C because there's not that layer of abstraction that's there for the JVM. If you think about it, Java is both a compile type language and an interpreted language almost kind of simultaneously in a way, because you compile it down into your Java code, into your uh, into your um, bytecode, and then that bytecode is run through the JVM and then actually executes to the machine. And so that's your compile target for Java, whereas our compile target here is actually for the underlying system. So it actually creates an executable file that the system itself, without the aid of a JVM, requires. But conceptually, .class files and a, uh, these um, these object files are are very similar to each other. That's just kind of the nuanced difference. Does that answer your question? And then it looks like I have another question here that's asking just to go over the concept of this very last uh, statement here, the return zero. So whenever I have a um, my main function in uh, in C. And let's distinguish this from our main method in Java. So recall that Java is, first of all, an object's first language, which you're familiar with. So all of our, all of our behaviors, all of our methods have to belong to a class. And of course, that's what distinguishes a method from a function. A function is a, effectively a method that's in the global namespace, that's not tethered to or belongs to a class. So inside of C, our kind of primary set of packaging our codes into procedures would be at the at the global namespace. So we don't have to uh, inv uh, call a class on this. Now, our main function in C distinguishes a little bit from our main method in Java in the fact that it has a return type. So remember, your return type in Java is void. So it just executes all those instructions, and that's it. Now, the idea behind the main function in C is that it can return back a numerical value that after it's done executing, or if it's not done executing, either way, it can return or resolve into a value to let you know if it executed properly or not. So if I return back a zero value, that's supposed to let the system know, hey, I'm done executing and I return back with uh, zero errors. I, I ran as per expected. Now, inside my application, I can return back from the main function with non-zero values, which that would then indicate to whatever the callee function was 
that or which would probably be the system, right? Because that's where we're going to run our main function from, that we ran into some kind of error, some kind of issue while executing our code. So this was just a way of kind of doing logging uh, and tracking of errors when running our main function to be able to provide, uh, first of all, kind of a Boolean value. Did we run successfully or not? Zero or some non-zero value. And if it's a non-zero value, then you could use those numbers in an intelligible way for debugging purposes. Did that answer your question in terms of what the return zero again was? And then finally, I had one other question. Uh, these lectures are saved if we need to rewatch them. Oh yeah, of course. In fact, they've already been posted. If you go to the link inside of the Discord server under resources or videos or something like that, uh, there's a post to the playlist where you can access these right on the YouTube uh, channel. And these will all go in the same playlist. In fact, I encourage you not only to look at the um, videos from this lecture where I'm doing more live coding examples, but I also encourage you to potentially check out the lectures where I go more slide heavy from last semester. And both those should be in their own individual playlists. So we should have a playlist for 2024, which is this set of lectures. And there'll be a playlist for 2023, which is going to be the lectures from last semester. Excellent. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and we'll continue with our quick overview of our um, of our C code. Then try to get ourselves up to a point where we can start seeing some things that are a little bit nuancedly different. But until then, we'll continue to look at things that are kind of similar. So the next thing I want to look at is if we're talking about uh, operators, we can close out of this. Let's go here. Let me clear this workspace here. Let me remove my increment application. Okay, so the next thing I want to take a look at is going to be the um, relational operators. So our relational operators I usually subdivide these into two different categories. I usually like to think of these as, um, um, well, relational operators as being less than, greater than, greater than equal to, less than equal to. And then I usually think of equal and not equal as equality operations. But we'll just talk about them all in this same source code file to keep it easier and, uh, and compact it. So just jumping through this, I'm going to go ahead and initialize two variables, A and B to respectfully 10 and 20. And then I'm gonna declare a variable called result. And we are gonna go ahead and, uh, and then we're gonna go ahead and uh, assign things into result. So here we'll check to see if A is equal to B, is 10 equal to 20, then we'll print the result of that. That should be clearly, our concept of that is going to be false, but notice that the result of what we get back whenever we do any of these relational or equality operations is gonna be an integer value because Boolean is not actually a primitive, a supported primitive data type. It doesn't, it doesn't exist uh, in, in, in normal traditional C, we just treated our uh, numerical values in the form of Boolean uh, evaluations. So that means this should return back the value of zero, which means false and any non-zero term would be true. So then let's check not equal. Well, this should result to be true. And then we'll go ahead and um, store the result of that. Then we'll check uh, is A greater than B, then the result of A less than B, then the result of A greater than or equal to B, then the result of A less than or equal to B. And for all these instances, we're going to print out the value of A the value of B and the value of results. So that means each of my print F statements are gonna have like these three placeholder values with percent D indicating I'm gonna pass in some integer value of A, B and result. And of course the D inside of that integer value is representative that it's gonna print out in a decimal format. I can actually choose to do a decimal or octal if I did O or a hexadecimal if I did X. So uh, if you were wondering why is D a value that relates specifically to integers, it's because of the base evaluation. I can actually express any of my integer values in base eight, base 10, 
for base 16. Okay, so with that said, let's go ahead and let's compile this code. Okay, so this is called 04 relational. And so let's call it, I'm gonna dash out to give it a name and let's just call it relational. Okay. And so we should get our, you can see right here inside of my, um, my directory, I now have a relational app. So we'll go ahead and execute that dot slash relational. And we could see we should get the resolutions we want. The only thing that might be slightly different in terms of Java is again, where we resolve back these values that are either zero or one to represent our Boolean evaluations. Of course, any non-value could be uh, treated as a true value, but you could see the default value that our application that C gives back whenever a value resolves to be true is typically one. Okay, perfect. If there's no questions related to this, I'll move on to the logical operation. So let's go ahead and close this. Let's clean out our workspace. I'll clear this out. Let's go ahead and remove that. Just make sure we don't get all cluttered up. So RM will remove a, a, uh, our file. And let's go ahead and take a look at our... Um, Okay, here we go. So for our logical operations, we'll just walk through this. We Since logical operations are and, or, or not, and XOR, then they're, ex they're expecting Boolean type operations. So then we'll go ahead and set the values that we'll go ahead and evaluate upon as either one or zero, where one is gonna represent our truthy value and zero will represent our falsy value. Then we'll go ahead and declare a, um, a uh, variable just to hold our result, which will also be an integer data type. So here we're gonna do a logical and, so this is going to and one and zero together, which should be false. Then we're gonna go ahead and do or, so notice the operators for AND are exactly as they are in Java. The operator for OR is exactly as it is in Java. Uh, we'll record the, the result of this OR operation between A or B, and this should resolve into a true value, since at least one is true. And then here will not, not should invert my A. So if my A was a one, it should become a zero. I'll not the B, so if my B was a zero, it should become a one when I print this out. And then finally, I'm going to do my, uh, that's not quite right. I'll do my, um, that's, wait a second. I don't think that is correct. I'll do my XOR value. Okay, let's see here. I don't know if I actually have it. Uh, I think my XOR value is going to be bitwise XOR, XOR value. We'll test this out, but I don't think... Let's see here. Okay, let's take a look at this. And let's save this. Let's do GCC. Uh, zero five dog, and let's do. Oh, I just did a dot out. Oh well, yeah, perfect. So yeah, so this is going to be a logic. So they don't they don't have a logical XOR. I don't. I'll have to double check that. I don't think that there is. We will clear this. Oh. We will clear this. Let's run that and let's re perfect. Okay. So we won't care. So we'll look at XOR as it relates to bitwise operations, not to logical operations. In terms of our logical operations, the ones we really care about, at least right now, are ands, our ors, uh, and our um our nots. 
And so we can see when we go to resolve this, that they work exactly as we'd expect them to. Just they are doing it in integer values and not um, and not inside of uh, true false values like what we see in Java. Okay, let me go ahead and clear this out. And let me do an RM on my a dot out. Okay, so let's close this. So pretty much everything is very similar. Okay, now let's go to bitwise operators. Yeah, this is got my typing too much really quickly through something in my logical operators that should belong to my bitwise operators, but we can finally see our bitwise operators here. So recall that bitwise operators you probably are more familiar with inside of your assembly class than inside of your Java class. Is that correct? Like, I don't think you, even though these these operators exist in Java, we I don't think that the uh, the intro to programming classes really cover bitwise operators that much because they wait for you to really get to understand binary sequences and binary strings so that you can see the real power of doing bitwise operations. I mean, it's in the name, bitwise operations is done on bits and you don't touch bits until machine uh, until uh, machine language and assembly, right? But you should be familiar with these operations, the bitwise and, the bitwise or, the bitwise XOR, the bitwise nots, and then your left shifts and right shifts from assembly. Does everyone kind of recall that? Excellent. So even though, so we're going to cover these Operators, these operators actually exist in Java. You probably don't use them, but you're going to be familiar with the logic from your assembly class. And so notice we're going to look at a couple different things here. So with bitwise operations, we want to really think of the way that we're representing or modeling our values here, our numbers, as being a binary sequence, as being effectively uh, as being uh, a, a, a collection of bits. And so then it makes it easier for us to understand how these operations are occurring. For that reason, I'm going to use unsigned integers just to illustrate that I want to treat these as my um, binary sequences. So I'm going to put unsigned in front of here. For my A, my B, and my result, I'm going to assign the value of 12, which we can think of binary as 1100, zero, zero, and the value of 5, which in terms of binary, we can think of 0, 1, 0, 1. And then we'll go ahead and put our results in uh, in whatever, whatever the operation is that we're going to go ahead and do. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to just print out our initial values so that when we look at the console, we can recall what is our value of A and what is our value of B. But notice they're not percent %D, they're percent %X. So when I print out my integer values, I want to express them not as decimal base 10 values, but as hexadecimal base 16 values. Now, the trick is I um, I can't by default do binary strings inside. Uh, there's no um, there's no like percent B for binary uh, inside of C. If we wanted to do binary, we would actually have to create a function to parse through our our uh, value and translate it into a binary sequence. So what we can do though is since everyone should be familiar with parsing hexadecimal, so recall that goes from zero to F, then we'll just represent our binary sequences in forms of, of our hexadecimal values. So in blocks of four values. Okay, so we'll print that out in hexadecimal. Then we're gonna do the bitwise operation of and between A and B. So that's where it lines our bits together. And then it effectively does kind of a logical operator between the lined up sets of bits. And then we'll do the same with bitwise or. So again, it's gonna line our two sets of bit sequences together and it'll or the individual bits together toggling them into an either zero or one position and then retranslating that into whatever the hexadecimal or decimal value is. However, we express it in this instance, hexadecimal value. Then we'll do the XOR, which means that it resolves to be true only if both bits are zero or both bits are 
one, if they're alternating, then it's a falsy value. Then we'll do bitwise knots. Then we'll shift the entire binary se sequence to the left by one bit. And then we're gonna shift the binary sequence to the right one bit. Okay, so let's see. No, it's not. This would work fine, honestly, uh, if I just did the ints. It should work fine in this instance because I don't think I'm dipping into the negatives. But I do want to I want to illustrate that when working with binary sequences, in order to be safe, you probably want to go ahead and uh, declare that this is unsigned so that it knows not to apply the rules that convert a value into if it's a leading one value into a negative value or not, especially since we're shifting bits around. So it, it might not be it might not be necessary, but it's a safety thing. One of the things you're going to learn about C is it doesn't have the safety nets that Java has. That's why C has a very bad reputation. Oh, let me also, for the purposes of the video, restate what I just answered in terms of the question. I was asked a question, is it absolutely necessary to clarify unsigned or signed int if you're going to perform bitwise operations on the variable? And my answer is no. You could just do int and you could do all these and they will work just fine. The reason why we want to do unsigned, I would state, is that if we know we're treating these as binary sequences, then we get a safety protection for us to ensure that the system's not going to go behind us and translate a value thinking it's a signed value because recall that signed values use leading one values to indicate whether it's a negative value or a positive value. So if we want to try to prevent that from occurring and we know in this instance we're going to treat this data in a particular way, then we want to be as explicit as possible with the compiler so that the behavior we get back from it is consistent with what we expect it to be. And so I can't reiterate this enough. C is renowned for being a difficult language because it does not provide the safety nets that Java does. So one reason why Java is such a popular language, especially in uh, large scale applications and especially in academia is that there's a lot of safety there. It will prevent you from doing things that will lead to bugs or to issues that are hard to debug. Uh, let me give you an instance of what we can do, for instance, in, in um, that we haven't even seen yet. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to show the display of this and then I'm going to show you and you'll see more examples of this as we go through source code of the fact that C will just allow us to do whatever we want. We will tell it to do instructions and there'll be super unsafe instructions, but it'll do it anyway. But it can cause for erroneous behavior because it technically is an ill-formed instruction. Like we're doing operations on things we've never officially uh, initialized or set values to. And since like the, the idea, like when I'll, I'll I'll show you an example. Let me run this and then I'll show you how we can break things in weird ways. Okay, so let's see, let's save this. Let's clear my terminal. Let's let's run this as it were first, just to see our behavior. And then let's see some, some interesting things. Well, at least one interesting thing. Okay, so then here, oh, I did, I did that without naming it. So the default name is a.out. So let me run my a.out. And so here, let's see if this is consistent with everything we expect it to be. So here, a, the variable a is assigned the hexadecimal value of c, right? Which is the integer value of uh, the decimal value of 12. And b is assigned five. Our bitwise operations between c and five would resolve into a bitwise and of four, which would be uh, one, zero, zero. And so, yeah, we can see how if we do that bitwise op operation, and then let's see here, then if we do C uh, um, and bitwise operation with five, we would get D. If we do XOR, we get nine. If we do the bitwise not, it's going to toggle all of our bits 
so that we get whatever our address of whatever our uh, bit sequence is. So if our bit sequence is a 32-bit number for integers, then all the leading values are going to be Fs, right? Ones, till we get to our three. If we do a, um, and so this C is the hexadecimal value, right, of tw 12. If we do uh, take our C value, that's uh, the variable A. So if we take hexadecimal value for 12 and we shift that over to the uh, left by one, we're going to get 18. And if we shift that over to the right, we should get six. Okay, so and let's see. It might be easier if we take and look at it this way. So instead of that, so we can look at a an hex, and the hex is easier to kind of think about than binary bitwise. But let's look at the actual binary string too. So let me go ahead and bin bitwise. So let's go ahead and, oh, I need O. So let me go ahead and compile this. And let's look at the same thing again, but in terms of looking at it inside of our, bin in terms of binary sequences. So if I had my binary sequence of A represented here, right, which is my value for 12 and my B, which is my value for five, we can see much easier when we're doing our anding and our oring and our xoring, and when we do our uh, not operations or if we shift to the left or the right. So this is doing the exact same thing that we saw with our hexadecimal code, but we can see with our binary sequences, it's much easier to parse. And if you just wanna see how this particular impl implementation works. Let's actually compare it really quick. So in this implementation, we added a little bit more logic. We'll kind of build towards this logic a little bit more, but you can see we created this function, which is gonna be called two binary. It's gonna take in our integer number. It's gonna take in a reference for a string, a character array, which represents the string, which will be the binary string that will impute and the number of bits we want to encode it as. We're gonna put at the very end of our string, cause it's nothing more than an array, the null character to illustrate that this is the termination point. And then we'll just do a for loop that'll iterate through and then do an operation such that it will resolve to be a one or zero, depending on what the value is as we step through the bits. And then we will store that into our string. And then once we do that, then we're effectively building a binary string by evaluating the uh, the number itself. Uh, and so then we're effectively doing all the same operations, but we're just calling our function. So just, just to kind of map how we could, if we wanted to get that binary string, it's not as simple as getting the hexadecimal string, but in terms of just illustrating the behavior, which is what we care more about, I think it's more evident on what's occurring. Now, I did say, let me show you one of the things that's very dangerous about uh, C. What if I declare this result right here? Suppose I have this result declared and let's say I want to print it, right? So in Java, what would happen if I tried to do that? So let's let's do this. Let's say result, and then it's an integer. So let me do percent %d, and then new line character, and then let me pass in result. So here, notice in the very first lines of code I have, I'm doing initialization of a and b. I'm only declaring result, but I'm going to try printing result at. Yeah, it hasn't been assigned to value. So what's going to happen if I do that? What would happen in Java if I did that? Yeah, it would it would throw, yeah, we would it would report back to us, right? But look, when I do that in C, it uh, compiled just fine. 
So now when I run it, what do you think the value I'm going to get for results going to be? What do you, it does, do you think it's a, 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 you think undefined? Undefined is usually for pointers though, right? So undefined or null are usually things to refer to pointing to a memory address, which this kind of is, but usually that points to like data structures that are represented as reference types. But it's a primitive data type, right? So would it resolve maybe to, yeah. So those who say random numbers, go yeah, whatever is inside that memory address, that's what it's going to return. So let's take a look at what that happens to be. So we do bitwise. So it happens to be minus one, two, three, nine, five, five, four, seven, three, six. Yeah. So if I forget, so if I declare this variable and then I forget to assign it somewhere, but then use it elsewhere in my code, it'll actually have a value. And it's going to, it's going to be a non-zero value. It's going to be whatever value that binary sequence is in that memory address when I go and dereference it. So C code blindly allows me to map an alias, a name that of my choosing, like result or A or B, to some location in memory and just store things or look up the value there. So I can either write uh, a value into it or I can look up a value and read from it. If I read from it without writing into it, that's completely fine. It'll just return to me whatever's there. There's something there, whatever. I just don't know what it is. So clearly my code shouldn't depend on something I don't set myself because it's going to be random. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's, it's going to be something that definitely causes erroneous behavior and it does not get reported. Notice it's running this as if it were normal operational code. And there is so many instances that we're going to see inside of C code where we're allowed to do this. And this is one reason that makes C very dangerous is that it's just, it, it lets you do whatever you want to do. It takes your statements very literally. And if you do them in error, if you do them without realizing some of the implications, like if you miss something, it won't necessarily report that to you. And these are reasons why languages that came behind C kind of offered more and more protections to make code bases, especially very large code, base, uh, code bases, much more secure and easier to maintain and debug and to identify when things like that are missing, because those can be create errors that are, if you're in a large enough code base, it's hard to find that that was why that broke. Okay, let's see. Let's uh, let's remove some things. So let's uh, let's clear our workspace out and move on. So let's remove this bitwise. Oh, let's remove our bin bitwise, and let's remove this a dot out. Okay. Okay. Um. So that's all of the primitive operators for the most part. Let's take a look at truncation. Truncation is something you should be also familiar with inside of um, inside of Java. So just examining this source code file inside of our main function, we're gonna declare. So truncation, if you recall in Java, before I start reading through source code, simply means that there are instances where you might have data that is too large to fit into a different data type. And so, for instance, integers and characters both hold numerical values, but a character is uh, one byte and a integer is four bytes. So one byte only holds X amount of values, right? It doesn't hold as it, it only holds um, two to the four number of different permutations of uh, binary sequences as opposed to your, um, I'm sorry, uh, two, it's, it's a binary sequence, so it's not two to the four. It's going to be two to the uh, eight uh, for your, for your one byte versus two to your 32 for your, um, for your integer value. 
So if we try to store a value that's too large, that's an integer into a character, what it'll do is, what C's gonna do is it's gonna transfer as many bytes as possible over, and then whatever it can't, it just discards. So we can see the result of this. We'll take an integer i of 321, and then we're going to take it and we're going to assign that value, that integer value into a character value. It'll grab as much as it can and then truncates the rest. We will take another example of this. We'll see how we'll take the double value of pi, which is 3.14159. That's, you know, it obviously goes much, much deeper than that, but we'll take just something that has a fractional component and then we'll, we'll go ahead and save that into an integer value. We'll see how that truncates the entire fractional component, leaving just the integer portion. And then finally, for truncation, just to illustrate this, we're going to take a uh, long, a double value, which is um, a 64-bit precision of a uh, of a floating point number, and then we'll go ahead and save that into a float value, which is a 32-bit representation of a fractional number, and then we'll see what the results of that are. So let's take a look at this and just see our truncated values, and then we can move on. So let's do GCC. And so I'll call this 07-truncated. And then let's call this trunk. And let's run our trunk here, our trunk code. So here you'd see if we start with the integer of 321, it's going to truncate that to be just 65. We're going to leave, we're, if, if you actually look at the binary, we end up losing the most significant bits in that translation. Uh, if we, inside of the bit binary sequence, if we look at the truncation of our double value to our int, we lose the fractional numbers. And this is pretty interesting, right? If we take, and this is this is also should really impress upon you why you should always use double for your approximate values for things that are fractional floating point values as opposed to uh, float values. If we take this value here in our double and we try to represent that using a float, you could see the amount of loss we have there. Where the last, like the tens digit and the singles digit is not even, we've lost all of the precision points and we've even lost some of the, some of the, um, in, in the tens and singles units, some of the precision there. So you can see, which brings us to a, another interesting thing you should be aware of. I know this was probably harped on inside of Java, but I want to really harden your understanding. Maybe you've, you've seen this already inside of um, assembly, but floating point values are fractional values, uh, whether they're float or double or only approximations. Never use equality operations on your floating point values. It's not even a limitation of the machine. Clearly the machine is given a limited amount of encodable bits to represent any given number. And so that might seem on the surface like a hardware constraint, but it goes beyond being a hardware constraint. Fractional values, these floating point values, mathematically are kind of fuzzy. They, they kind of have rules where if we want to map them to have a onto relationship with the integer sets there's things we have to say is uh is 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 uh equivalent to one another this is why if you've ever seen the um the expression 0 0.9999 repeating is equal to one that's a necessary fact in order to be able to map our integer number set onto our floating point number set. Otherwise, the operators, the the way that we can manipulate and transform transform numbers simply don't work. Uh, and it's just a consequence of, of the way that uh, fractional numbers are even like conceptually uh, represented. And we're going to see that. We're going to see. So the question is, if we can't actually have tree quality, if, if even the very definition of a floating point number is an approximation, then how do you do equality for that? And of course, you have math classes that go into this. You probably define this inside of uh, maybe, just probably not discrete, but probably definitely calculus. One of the things that, that defines what makes calculus such a 
uh, meaningful endeavor in terms of quantifying things is the fact that it allows us to work with um, with infinitesimal units. So a lot of times there's a lot of, um, I think there's a lot of uh, emphasis on infinities in calculus, but where it really gets more interesting is uh, is the infinitesimal. So something that gets infinitely small because that allows us to be able to say, okay, at some point we can create a threshold where we say these are close enough, there's enough similarity that they are equivalent to one another. And so let's take a look at that. Let's close this. I've kind of motiva motivated this enough. Let's look at approximations and how that results from our floating point values. So here I'm going to include not just my standard input output uh, header file, but also from uh, the standard library, the math.header file, so that we can do some math operations. And we'll take a look at which one it is when I get there, and I'll explain why. So inside of our main function here, we're going to do a couple of things. First of all, I want to show how we can't trust either floats or doubles, right? Even though double gives us double the precision, it's still going to give us some issues. So if I take a look at, um, so if I do, if I want to do floating point literals, the same in Java, I would go ahead and use an F, lowercase, well, it could be capital too. I use an F after my uh, my literal value, my numerical value. So here I'm going to assign to A the value of 0 0.1. And here I'm going to assign to B the value of 0 0.8 as floating point numbers. Then I'm going to add A and B to sum. So what should that be? Should that should be, it seems like that should be 0 0.9, right? Like conceptually that seems true. 0 0.1 plus 0 0.8 should be 0 0.9. So I'm going to make a literal value of 0 0.9. Then I'm going to create a value, to, an integer value for result, which is going to either be true, false, or are they equal or not? So let's take a look at how approximate, how approximate these values are when testing for equality. So if we actually use the double equal sign, which is our equality operation on floats, right? I'm going to do that here on line 14. So is my sum of A plus B equal, equal to C? And that's going to resolve into either zero or one. And then I'm going to print out the result of this, right? I'm going to say, okay, show me the value of sum, show me the value of C, and then tell me what it returns when I look for equality. Then what I'm going to do is this is the appropriate way. This is the appropriate way to uh, do this, not just in programming, but this is actually how you also do this in terms of uh, calculus too, in terms of mathematics. So we'll actually kind of set bounds or limits on what we define something to be within a threshold of counting as being equal. So we'll set our limits, our, our threshold, to be 0 0.0001. And then what we can do is then we're going to use this math operation because we don't know how it's deciding which one is like more positive or negative than the other. But what we want to do is we want to find the difference between the sum and our, our literal value, whatever the value we think it is, the two values that are close together. We find the difference of them, but the positive difference... So we're going to do our absolute value. And in particular, our like uh, floating absolute value. And so the difference between that, if it's less than our threshold value, then we're going to claim that that is the equivalent of being the same. So presumably, this, this is another way of testing to see if this is true or false if they're equal or not, that's what true or false means. So are they equal? Then we're going to do the same thing with doubles, but we're going to vary it up with, with different values. So we're going to take the value of 0 0.1. Now, without the F, by default, floating point values are treated as double values. So I'm going to have 0 0.1 and 0 0.2. And then my Z value is going to be 0 0.3. So I'm going to take my sum double, and that's going to be 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2, which should be 0 0.3, right? Then I'm going to test with my, my 
equality operator where I just say, okay, is my sum double equal to my Z value? Is 0 0.3 equal to 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2? And then I'm going to print out that result. And then I'm going to do the same kind of thresholding. I'm going to set a limit. I'm going to subtract one from the other and see if it's less than that limit. And then I will go ahead and print all this out. Okay, so before I, okay, let me clear this out. Before I run this, do, is there wagers? What what do you think is going to happen with the equality operator versus the threshold? And you think everything's going to be true? You think it's going to be true for the floats and not the doubles? You think it's not going to be true for the floats, but it will be true for the doubles? What What are your guesses? True for the thresholds. So is that so is that making the assumptions going to be false for the equality operators? True for the floats. Let's take a look. Okay, so here we go. So when I check, is 0 0.9 equal to 0 0.9? I'm using the default mappings here. Clearly, there's bits that are way, way, way down that have to be offset. But here we could see when I'm testing my sum to my actual value, it's returning to zero. That means that's false. It's, it's saying that it, those aren't equal. However, if I use the threshold approach for testing against equality, which is, again, is one of the concepts that's actually explained to you in calculus on how to evaluate infinitesimal values, we see that actually returns one. If you ever wondered why calculus is meaningful, it actually gives concepts as simple as identifying floating point numbers. It kind of has explored these concepts on the appropriate way for evaluating uh, um, this idea of uh, equality for units that are infinitesimally small and can have these minute differences that we say, oh, we'll just establish a limit to say, yeah, they're they're pretty much the same. And so here we can see the same thing here. If we if we try equality on our doubles, it also returns a zero. But if I use the thresholding approach when where I set limits and see if it's within a scope, then I'm going to go ahead and return back a true value. And you can see right here in the code, I'm not doing anything crazy. And this is one of the things that Again, is a is a it could be a pitfall for you inside of coding. It's one of these instances. If you ever try to um, try to do equality operations, primitive operator uh, equality operations on anything besides integer value, anything that's floating point numbers, then you can definitely, even when it seems as simple as comparing zero point one plus zero point two to zero point three, you could get behavior that you don't expect. This is why you avoid equality operators if you're not dealing with integers. Just something to impress upon you. I'm sure you already covered this right inside of Java. This is something they should have covered in Java on distinguishing how equalities are, are uh, distinguished between things, especially between integers and doubles. But if not, now you can really see it. You, you get uh, another exposure in this class. Okay, so the next thing I want to show then is, because we still have some time, let's remove this. Let's clean out our workspace. Let's remove trunk. Let's clear. Okay, the next thing I want to show off then is compound assignments. We'll see that compound assignments are kind of exactly the same as what we saw in Java. So if I go in here, and I create two variables, uh, undeclared variables, uh, A and temp. And then again, I'm gonna import my standard input output heading file so I get my print F. So I can do a, um, so compound assignment are just those assignment operators that allow you to do some other primitive operator on the data, on the value, and then overwrite. So a, a compound, Operator allows you to read the value of a variable, produce some operation on it, 
some primitive operation on it and then overwrite the original value with a new value based off of that operation. So you've probably seen this as like with the arithmetic operations. So you could do like, for instance, the plus equal, the plus of the minus equal, the star equal, the uh, slash equal, the percent equal, all do does your arithmetic operations, right? So it'll do a modulus operation on whatever the value was, and then modulus it against three, or divide by four, or multiply by two, or subtract by three, or add by five, right? So you've seen those probably before. You can also do other um, compound operators though. Like for instance, you could do the bitwise. So you can actually do a uh, left shift by two on this, on the variable that holds uh, our value of one here. Or you could do a right shift by one. Or you can do a bitwise and. So take whatever the value is and and it by the value of three. Or you could do a bitwise or. Or a bitwise XOR. So beyond, I guess what I'm highlighting here is besides just doing your a, um, typical arithmetic operators, you can also do your bitwise operations in the form of a compound assignment. And again, if I want to see how that looked in practice, we can go ahead and just quickly just go ahead and uh, compile this. I'll just call this compound. Oh, let's put an O in there. Okay. Now let's run that. And we can see it's exactly as what we would expect. 10 plus 5 overwrites the original 10, so now it becomes 15. 10 minus three overwrites the 10 to become seven. 10 times two overwrites the 10 to become 20. 10 divided by four overwrites the 10 to become two. 10 modulus three overwrites the 10 to become one. One left shift two overrides the one to become four. One right shift one overwrites the one to become a zero. Six bitwise and three overrides the six to become two. Two bitwise or by two overrides the six to become six. Um, six XOR with one overrides the six to become seven. So the question then is, is there a preference to using compound operators or using the operations where you put your variable name in the left-hand expression and the right-hand expression, where, I'm sorry, where you put the variable name in the right-hand expression and then overwrite into the left-hand expression. And so my answer to you is always take the approach that makes your code as readable as possible. So if it is more, if your code reads easier by being more explicit and say, going along the lines of something like X equals X plus five, then do that as opposed to X plus equal five. So always, always go with readability. But there are instances where it does create very readable code to use compound assignment operators. But I will leave that judgment call to you. But one thing you should always endeavor to do as a software engineer, especially when working with C, is to make your logic as self-evident as possible. Because C allows for a lot of nefarious, erroneous behavior to crop up into your code. Okay, so my next source code would be, I think, my, I would I would now del delve into uh, control structures, and I have four minutes left. Control structures are relatively easy, but for concept orientedness to keep things conceptual, I might just kind of break here in terms of the examples, so that I'm not breaking an entire section at the very last few moments of this lecture, and then continue the other section in the next. So I think this might be a good break point, at least in terms of our code. Now, with that said, is there any 
uh, uh, is there any other questions? I, I did get some private messages about making the C code accessible. And what I will do about that is I will package up all of this example code and I will make it available inside of our Discord server. So if, if you want access to the C code, I'll probably what I'll do is I'll publish it onto GitHub. I'll create a GitHub repo and I'll both publish the addresses inside of the descriptions inside of the YouTube playlist, inside of each of the YouTube uh, uh, recordings. And then I'll also publish the same uh, GitHub repo inside of our Discord so that no matter where you're at, whether you're in Discord or if you're going through the playlist, you'll have access to the source code examples. So thank, thank you for the person who had asked the question about the availability of the source code so that you all have available uh, the ability to access it. And then remember, um, I guess I could have actually accessed the, uh, the um, runtime environment, the actual uh, shell lab environment to be able to do this. I'm still inside my local environment. Eventually I'm going to migrate into our shell lab environment, but you should already have a lab environment where you can access your, uh, where everyone can access the command line and the GCC compiler uh, pre-installed. And so I would advocate once I publish the source code files that everyone go check it out, get these files so that you can read through them yourself, run them yourself and actually play around with them. You could change the values and do whatever you want. And I think once we kind of step through a little bit, maybe after we go through the next lab, uh, the next lecture, I'll actually post the first lab so you can start thinking about the lab. And I kind of want to go through that lab as well when we get to that point. Excellent. Is there any other questions that anyone has up to this point? I think up to this point, everything should still look moderately like Java. So uh, everything for the most part is kind of similar except for the uh, differences between Boolean values and integer values, how our, our integers, our Booleans are effectively evaluated as integers. But other than that, I think everything is very, very similar. O obviously also the lack of classes. We don't have a class keyword inside of C. And we'll see what the substitute for that is uh, uh, in a future lecture, uh, either next lecture or the lecture after. So, I would recommend, so there's several ways. So I have the question, what is the least painful way to run C on Windows? So if you want to set up a Windows environment, because um, let's, let's think about this. Mac OS already has um, a, I want to say they switched to Z shell, but they have a POSIX compliant shell environment by default. Ubuntu and every like Linux derivative also has a POSIX compliant shell. If you want to use C, for shell programming, I would recommend looking at Windows Subsystem Linux, what's abbreviated as WSL. Windows has done a fantastic job of actually working with Canonical, who does the package manager for Ubuntu, to actually bring a POSIX compliant terminal as a first party application, as a, as a, a first party environment to the Windows operating system. So I would definitely um, recommend checking out WSL. Uh, in addition to that, you could always, now if you're, if you're talking about just C code in general and not systems level code, you can always use a IDE and many IDEs will allow you to install compilers and then use the IDE to compile and run your code that way. Is there any other questions? Excellent. Well, we've run out of time today. Uh, I will see you all. I think next week will be our next meetup. I don't think that there's another holiday for next week quite yet. So I will see you all uh, on Tuesday then.